where I said my name is Matthew Bowerman. Uh, I probably know and recognize half of you. Uh, to the other half, um, I am Matthew, and I would love to meet you and get to know you um, at the service. So thank you for being here. It is a pleasure to gather together to worship the Lord, um, study His Word, um, to come in here after a long and tiring week where so many things have been vying for our attention and for our hearts. Not that those things are unimportant, um, but they are not ultimate, um, and so it's just a, a privilege um, to be able to come together and to set our eyes on Jesus. And it's my prayer to the end that uh, the Lord, by His Spirit, would make Jesus bigger in our hearts than He's ever been before. So if you would, go ahead and open with me to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to be continuing in our study of the book of Matthew. We are going to be looking at the parable of the wedding feast. And I actually remember uh, my favorite wedding that I've ever been to. Or favorite, at least in terms of the most fun wedding that I've ever been to. And Lauren, I'm sorry, it wasn't our own wedding. <laughs> of course, I loved it. It was great, but nah, I was nervous and just trying to keep an eye on everything and just, just trying to make sure that everything was running smoothly. So, well, Lauren, love you, but our wedding was not the most fun wedding. It wasn't even a wedding of a close friend or a family member. To be honest, I, to this day, could not tell you the names of the bride and groom of the most fun wedding I've ever been to. It was four or five years ago, and Lauren and I were both in Birmingham, and uh, one of her friends was getting married. So Lauren and I were kind of dating, and it was going well. I didn't really know yet, but had a good feeling. And she invited me to go, and this wedding was in North Carolina. And it was... About this time of year, maybe about a month earlier, say mid-October, and so the, the leaves were changing, and so we got to leave Birmingham and drive up to North Carolina, we got to go through the Blue Ridge Mountain Parkway, it's just one of those perfect drives where you know, the windows are down, and the leaves are changing colors, and the air is crisp, and the football is back, and you just didn't have <laughs> a care in the world, it was just, it was a perfect weekend, and, and this, this wedding, uh, man, no expense was spared. It was actually held in an airplane hangar, uh, which, which sounds kind of like a weird thing, but you know, they'd obviously taken the airplanes out and like all the garage doors were open and it was set in, in the, the Smoky Mountains. So just everywhere you look, you could just see the leaves and the sun was going down behind the mountains and they served steak and I'm sure that there were other food options, but that is the only one that I remember. And there was an open bar, which I'm sure helped. And the DJ was great. But my favorite part of the wedding was that I didn't know a single person there. And so something that you might not know about me is that I love to dance at weddings. It might surprise you, but I, I'm probably a better dancer on the wedding floor than, than many of us. <laughs> I didn't know these people. They're all strangers to me, so it was just one of those rare times in my life where I thought, I can just go for it. I'm never going to see any of these people again. They will never be able to make fun of me about this again, so I'm just going to have the time of my life. And to this day, Lauren and I will probably say that is the most fun that we have ever had together was at somebody's wedding. I don't know. And the reason that I tell that story is because Jesus also introduces his parable that we are going to study this morning with a wedding feast. It's going to be in Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding feast, and Jesus starts out, verse 1 says, And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Now, if there is one thing that Jesus loves, Jesus loves a good way. If you remember in the Gospel of John in chapter 2, this is his very first public miracle, his very first act of public ministry. There was a wedding party that had run out of wine, and Jesus made more. Now, I know there are a lot more important theological truths to take away from Jesus turning water into wine, but I just think it's so funny and so cool that Jesus' first miracle was simply to keep a good party going. Jesus loves to have a good time. And a wedding feast is Jesus' first public act. And in addition to that, a wedding feast 
is also how Jesus is going to consummate his kingdom and bring about the redemption of all things. If you go to the end of Scripture, Revelation 19, we read about the marriage supper of the Lamb, where Christ's work of redemption will be complete and his blessings will flow far as the curse is found. And in that passage, John writes, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. So when Jesus pictures his redeeming work being brought to completion, and heaven and earth meeting in glory, it happens at a wedding. Jesus loves a good wedding. So just before we even get any further, here's just a little application for you. The next time that you're at a wedding, Think about it the way that Jesus does. Weddings and marriages are meant to point to and portray the love that Christ has for his bride, the church. So the next time that you are at a wedding, just kind of let yourself get carried away in that. Just let loose, have some fun. Let yourself get carried away in the friends and the family and the food and the drink and the hope and the happiness and the eager expectation of Christ's heavenly kingdom. When you think of the kingdom of God, think of the best wedding that you have ever been to and realize that it's just an accident. That for all of eternity, that, that best wedding you've ever been to, it's just a little foretaste. And let it grow your longing for the real thing. That should be how, as Christians, we think about weddings, and this is how we would expect the people in this parable to respond to the wedding invitation of a king with that joy and happiness and eager expectation. But as we read on, we see that that's not exactly the case. It says the king was going to give a wedding feast for his son. And then verse 3 says that he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. It's like any good king who's going to a wedding party for his son. He had spared no expense. He had killed the oxen and the fattened calves. Everything was ready. This was sure to be a great party, but nobody came. And they gave a bunch of excuses. They said, oh, I've got to get back home. I've got, I've got a family that I need to take care of. Or I've got, I've got to get back to my business work, which is really crazy right now. My boss is really expecting a lot of me right now. I'm, I'm just not going to be able to make it. Some didn't even give a rational reason. They just killed the servants who were simply acting as messengers, inviting them to the wedding. And, and I would love to spend a lot of time dissecting and digging into the reasons that people gave for not going to the wedding. For, for some people, it was just apathy. For others, it was hostility. There, there are whole sermons on, on those responses, examining different things in our hearts that make us ignore the kingdom of God. But for the sake of time, we're going to move on and look at how the king responded to his guest's rejection. In verse 8, we read that the king said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main road and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good, so the wedding hall was filled. With guests. So basically, the king is saying, the people who I invited first, the people who were first in line to receive an invitation, they are out, and we are going to find someone else to take their place. And, and this idea of someone squandering a God-given opportunity, I mean, God-given blessing, and then that blessing actually going to somebody else that really fits in with the context of this passage. You see this parable of the wedding feast comes at the end of a series of three parables that Jesus has given. Last week we looked at the beginning of Matthew 21 where Jesus made his triumphal entry riding in on a donkey. And in his own way, Jesus rode into Jerusalem and made his kingly and authoritative presence known. And right after he rides in on a donkey, he starts to get into a confrontation with the chief priests and the scribes and and all the other religious rulers of that day. And so he goes into the temple and he drives out the money changers and he flips the tables and he starts using the whip of the people who were making a mockery of his father's house. 
And then he went on to take the place of the elders and the priests in the synagogue and started preaching in their place. And like most people do, when you challenge their way of making money, when you challenge their status and their authority and their reputation, these religious leaders got mad. And so while Jesus was preaching, the elders and the priests interrupted Jesus and demanded, hey Jesus, you need to explain and give us a reason why you can challenge us. And so in response to this challenge from the scribes and the priests and the, and the religious rulers, Jesus launches into these three parables. And each of these parables has a similar message. They're, they're kind of like, you know, a, a three-ring Venn diagram with a lot of overlap. And in the middle is one overarching theme. And the unifying theme of the three parables is that one person or one group thought that they had the right to enter the kingdom of God. They thought that they were first in line, almost like a birthright, but it turned out they were removed from the line and that someone else took their place. In the parable of the two sons, the first parable, the parable ended with the elders and the priests thinking they were first in line, but because they did not listen to the message of John the Baptist about the coming kingdom of God and repentance, it was actually the tax collectors and the prostitutes who entered into the kingdom ahead of them. In the parable of the tenants, the second parable, Jesus said that the stone that the builders rejected had become the cornerstone, and that the kingdom of God would be taken away from you and given to a people who are actually producing the fruits of the kingdom. Meaning that though the ethnically defined people of God, the people of Israel, were first in line to receive God's blessings, they were God's chosen people, but because they had repeatedly committed idolatry, because they took their special place in God's redemptive plan for granted, God eventually said, fine. I'll give the kingdom to someone who is actually producing the fruits of the kingdom, someone who actually wants to be here. And then in the third parable, our one for this morning, it was the people who were on the original guest list. These were the first choice people who, when they ignored that blessing and opportunity, were quickly replaced by someone else. So before moving on to address the rest of the parable, let's deal with the primary question that Jesus is asking us. And the question that Jesus is asking in this parable and the investment of us this morning is why do you think that you are the first in line to inherit the kingdom of God? What part of you makes you think that you are inherently worthy or that you automatically deserve to be invited to the king's wedding? For the elders and the Pharisees and the scribes that Jesus was challenging in this parable, for them, what they thought made them deserving of God's kingdom was their ethnic and their spiritual heritage. They, they thought, we are the leaders of the Jewish people, God's chosen people, of all of the peoples, of all of the nations on earth that God has chosen. He chose us. And on top of that, we can trace our lineage all the way back to Abraham. There might not be a, a, a bigger titan or figure in the Old Testament than Abraham. Like how is that for an ancestral family tree? And on top of that, not only are we a part of God's you know, chosen, select people, but we are its leaders. We are its spiritual and societal leaders. We are in a special place. We speak on behalf of God. We offer the sacrifices. We offer the prayers. We, we just have this special place in God's special people. We come from the best of the best. We do all the wonderful things. And so, of course, God needs us. And of course, God would choose us. And of, and of course, God would invite us to the wedding of his son, and our names would be first on that list. That was their thing. But what's your thing? I know none of us would ever blatantly say that we deserve God's love and inclusion, but we ought to admit there's just something about our sinful nature and the hardwiring of our hearts that make us think that we can earn God's love. And so we'll say, well, I'm an eighth generation Christian. Every member of my family going back hundreds of years has been believed. So to something in my family, we're just a little more pure and spiritually elite. 
or uh, I'm a big tiger. I write a big check every week. I, I finance the whole operation. I put my money where my mouth is. And so, of course, God would be grateful for that. It can be kind of some of the baser, more obvious things like that, or it can even be more subtle. It can even be good, God honoring things that we rely on as reasons why God would choose us. You say, well, I show up early and stay late to help set up and tear down, or I serve back in the kids' ministry twice a month, or you know, me and my family are doing foster care, or adopting, or you know, we work with camels to reach Somalia, Somalia. You know, even these good, wonderful, God-honoring things, if we're not careful, we can look to those things and think, this is how I can earn God's love. This is why God would use me. Of course, I am going to be his first round back. And what this parable is showing us is that no, God does not need. What was surely a guest list of royalty and CEOs and statesmen and politicians and so on and so on was immediately replaced with some random people off the street. You got like the hot dog guy, the person shopping for their groceries, the hobo that you know, sits on the corner. Those are the people they brought in and replaced all these impressive Luke 19 even goes so far as to say that if we won't worship the Lord, then God can make the rocks cry out to worship Him. How's that for some kingdom of God mathematics and equivalences? In and of ourselves, you and I are inherently as valuable as a rock. Those rocks out there can do what we do in and of ourselves. So God is not looking for people who think that they are impressive. God is not looking for people who think that they are all that and think that they belong on the gospel all-star team. In fact, he's looking for the exact opposite. He's looking for people who know that they have nothing to offer. Who know that they are very replaceable. Who are just happy to be on the JV team and happy to be considered as a potential alternative. I love how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 1. He says, consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Think back on where you were when God showed his love to you. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble birth. That's kind of you're not that impressive. Because of that God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So as we move on, is just hear what Jesus is saying in his prayer. He's saying that if you think that you deserve to be included into the kingdom of God, then you be there. If you think that you deserve a spot on God's team, then you might be there. He's also saying that if you know that you don't belong, if you know that you have nothing to offer, if nothing in your hands you bring simply to the cross, you cling, if no works or heritage or money or status or anything of your own making is where your hope and faith lie, but if your only hope in life and death is the blood and the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, if that is you, that Jesus said, come on into my kingdom. We're having a heart. And I'm glad. So at this point in the parable, the original guest has been uninvited and a random ragtag bunch of people got dragged in off the streets as replacements. And when first reading the parable, you probably think that this story is now going to have a happy ending. The king finally got to throw the party he wanted, and the new guests were just grateful to be there. You think they're going to dance and sing and celebrate the night away, and that will be the end of the story. But as he often does, Jesus throws us a curveball. If you would, pick up with me in verse 11. But when the king came to look at the guests, he saw there a man with no wedding garment. He said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he, the man, was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness, 
In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, over the course of the now two millennia of church history, much ink has been spilled trying to figure out what is this wedding garment. It seems that the king was happy to have all of these guests here, but when he realized that this one guest wasn't dressed properly, he, he kicked them out. So since it seems like this dress attire is the criteria, is the make it or break it, it seems like pretty important. We need to know what this wedding garment symbolizes. I'm just going to say up front that there are many biblically defensible options and arguments for what these wedding garments might represent. If you look in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, you could reason that the garments represent baptism. There, in Galatians, Paul says, For many of you, as you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And we know from church history that early Christians wore baptismal garments or robes, and they were talking about being baptized. Or you could look to a passage that we've already looked to this morning, Revelation 19, about the marriage supper of the Lamb, and make the argument that the wedding garments represent good works. Again, I'll quote Revelation 19. It says, Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen, and this is where the linens are going to be defined for us, the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Maybe it's the righteous deeds, maybe it's the good works that result from faith, that outward garment, that outward expression and display of love that the wedding guests lack in result in him being kicked out. Well, the final option is that the garment, the wedding garments could just represent faith. It could represent true faith. The text does go out, out of the way to say that the second round of guests that were invited in were a mixed bag. They were both good and bad. Similarly, the church has always been a mixed bag of true believers and people who simply profess to be believers. It will be a mixed bag until the final day. And there will be those who claim Christ and pretend to follow him, but in the end it turns out that their faith was not genuine and they will not get to enjoy the feast. So, which one is it? If you're going to get kicked out based on what the wedding garment is. It's really important that we know that they represent baptism or true faith, the good works that result from true faith. Again, I, I think strong biblical support can be made for each of them. I could be talked into either three. But if you could allow me to teach you a helpful method for interpreting the parables that has been helpful for me over the years, I think we, we might be able to make some heads or tails of this. And, and this method for interpreting parables has two rules. The first rule is that when Jesus himself gives you the interpretation for a parable, take that interpretation. <laughs> Take it on face value and don't try to read into, into it more than there really is. If Jesus says that the seed represents the kingdom, it represents the kingdom. If Jesus says the seed represents the word of God, it represents the word of God. If you can give me a, allow me a sports metaphor, this might make sense to some of our football fans, but when you're, when you're interpreting the parable and Jesus gives you an answer, don't be afraid to dig and dunk your way down the field. You don't have to run the hook and ladder, you don't have to run the fumble cruise, you don't have to run the Fake 23 blast with the backside toward the first. Shout out Denzel. <laughs> Sometimes you just run between the tackles, get three yards, throw it to the guy in the flat, forget about the 80 yard touchdown pass, just get the first down. If Jesus gives you the answer, then keep it simple, stupid. That's rule number one. And if rule number two is that if Jesus does not give you the answer, if he does not give you the interpretation, don't be afraid to let the answer be a little more elastic. Be okay with a little wiggle room. Now, of course, study hard. Read the cross references where this passage, this topic is mentioned in other places in the Bible. Read the commentators. Try and figure out what people who are smarter than you have thought. But also realize that when Jesus told this story and when he gave this ambiguous story with an ambiguous answer. He knew that we would be a little confused. And he seems to be okay with that. Maybe the lack of a clear definition by Jesus here was intentional. I love how one commentator dealt with this ambiguity. 
and the possibility of multiple answers. When he said, perhaps, in this parable, with multiple answers regarding baptism or faith or good works, you know, with all the new Bible options, perhaps, Jesus is holding up a mirror. Perhaps Jesus is holding up a mirror to all Christians and is saying, take a good look. Are you properly dressed for my wedding? Take a good look and ask yourself, what do you lack? Are you still wearing the robe of your own righteousness? Are you still relying on yourself, thinking that you yourself are good enough? And if so, let this mirror point out to you your own idolatry of your own good works and simply cling to me by faith, and I will cover you with my own robe. You may be saying, look at yourself and see the robes of true faith, but notice that the garments of obedience are lacking. You have a profession of faith with your lips, but Jesus calls for a full body coat of many colors. Show me your faith, show me your love, show me your works, show me your baptism. There are many biblically responsible and viable ways to interpret the wedding garments, and for this morning, I think that is the point. Jesus is asking us to examine ourselves, to examine our hearts and ask, is there anything in my heart that is keeping me from entering into this kingdom? So he gives the parable and he ends it by leaving us with a warning. He ends simply with, for many are called, but few are chosen. On a land and plain, we might have to get a little technical here, because when I read Jesus' words, that many are called, but few are chosen, that the rest of my New Testament spidey senses start to tingle a little bit. And I can hear the Apostle Paul from places that he wrote later in the New Testament start to pipe up and make some noise. I can hear Paul pointing to Romans 8 and saying, Jesus, the stuff that I wrote in Romans 8 and, and what you're saying here might seem a little confusing to people. And so, without getting into too much of the weeds, let's just say that Jesus and Paul do not always. Uh, use the same word in the same way. Paul often uses the term call in terms of irresistible grace. Meaning that when God sets his love and affection on you in Christ, that your heart will soften and yield to the gospel of Christ. Whereas when Jesus uses the term call, he means offer the opportunity or invite it. Paul uses the word from God's perspective of God sovereignly calling his people to faith, Jesus uses the word from man's perspective, with the emphasis on the human responsibility to respond to God's call. Paul uses the word uh, of, of grace to pull us toward God. God, Jesus uses the word to push us, to push us through the narrow gate. Jesus concludes his parable with the one saying that many are called, but few are chosen, meaning You are called in the sense that you have received the offer from the king. You have heard the good news of the gospel. The wedding invitation came in the mail and is posted on the for the greater, and the invitation reads that God the Father and God the Holy Spirit request your presence at the marriage of Christ the Son to his bride, the church. Payment for this union has been made by the sinless and spotless blood of the Lamb, the groom Jesus Christ himself. And the only gift that we ask you to bring is your union. Bring your unworthiness, bring your sin, bring your shame, and the groom himself will clothe you, clothe you with his own righteousness. The invitation has been offered to you. You have been called. You are on the guest list. And so I will leave you with this question. How will you RSVP to the wedding supper of the Lamb and to the kingdom of God? Father, I ask now, in these moments, that by your spirit you would continue to work your word into our hearts. Father, would you illuminate the sin of our lives? Show us where we have committed idolatry. Show us where we have put our hope and our trust and our faith in things that are other than you. Would you be gracious enough to us to expose these things in us? Help us to see their folly and their worthlessness and their emptiness. Show us the 
emptiness of everything else so that we can behold the fullness and the glory and the beauty of Christ. Jesus, you have offered your salvation, your invitation to your wedding to all of us. Let us ask that by your spirit you continue to work in hearts to soften them so that they can respond. They can be clothed in your white righteous lens. They can enter into your kingdom. Pray this in Jesus' name.